Joining me to discuss free speech in sport is Dr. Vernon Andrews. He is a sports sociology scholar and a lecturer at San Jose State University. Um, Dr. Andrews, thanks for joining us to talk about free speech in sport. Sure, Kendrick. Good to be here. As you know, I'm sure, being a sports sociology scholar, there's so much conversation and confusion and debate about whether or not sport is a viable platform for political and social activism. What is your thought on this topic? Well, my thought is that sport hasn't had much, uh, I would say, uh, contestation since 1968, since the Olympics, when Smith and Carlos and Lee Evans and others protested. And as you know, that came right out of San Jose State uh, specifically. And I think Michael Jordan sort of set a pattern of athletes not participating in protest or in speaking out about politics because of sponsorship. So many athletes followed his lead and pulled away. Every now and then there was something that came up, but very, very small incidents up until, I would say, the Miami Heat and their protests with Trayvon Martin hoodies on. So you talk about how vibrant the protests were in 1968. Talk a little bit more about what has been the reason for us seeing this increased activism among athletes at the high school level, college level, professional level, and there are even international teams who are protesting. What has led to this rampant uh, expression that, that we're seeing among athletes? Sure. Well, I, th- I think I want to answer two questions with that one, with that, um, one question. And that is, first, I-, I would wish that there wasn't any protest in sport. I would wish that we didn't have any protest in sport, but unfortunately, due to a lot of the police actions against uh, black youth and black adults, people have been forced to try to redress those grievances in a public sphere. And athletes have a lot of family members and they themselves have often gone through uh, police harassment. So for them to sit idly by and watch, in this sense, wasn't uh, an appropriate response. So they have protested. And that's been the number one cause. It's been around the criminal justice system, uh, due process. It's been about uh, the sort of uncontested police uh, brutality in black communities that's gone on for decades, by the way. This isn't a recent phenomenon. And people have just had enough. And athletes uh, were on that public stage. And I think they just said, you know what? It's time we did something. I do think, though, that this was much like they do at sports contests when they have the wave. When everyone stands up and people stand up and follow up after that, I think athletes saw themselves as starting the wave, hoping that the rest of us, professors, uh, lecturers, uh, students, everyone else would join them. And though we haven't quite joined them in full numbers after that, I think their protests may have had some some effect because we've had a few cases since then. But I, I think it's primarily because of that one issue, that singular issue of police brutality in and around African-American communities. Well, since it's an off-the-field issue that's, you know, creating this this activism, you know, there's a notion that athletes can do that off the field, but during sports and on the playing field is not the place for what many perceive to be political, cultural, social expressions. Why is sport okay? Why is it okay? Well, that's actually a very good point. Uh, and again, I would I would ask a broader question, which is the, the underlying or undergirding issue here is, is sport an okay arena to express political ideas and w- whatever they are? And I think that we miss the point with that question that many things happen on sporting fields that are political that we often don't want to see as political because they're USA. But when you have a large flag, the entire size of the football field, on a football field, that's political. When you have the military marching out, that's political. When you have flybys by jets, that's political. It's all built into the military complex and the military structure, but we don't see that as political because we're American. But if we watched a game in any other country and they did the same thing with military might, with flags, with um, tanks or whatever else, we would gasp and say, wow, this country is so political, they're brainwashing their people. So before we accept that for ourselves, let's just look at the fact that there's a lot of politics that happen in sport. And if I was to say we would take the flag out of the game, 
or the national anthem or all those other things, people would get upset and say, no, we need that. So, I mean, there is, a, there is an argument by Emma Gill, a peer of ours, who says that, yeah, okay, if we're going to take athletes protesting out, let's take all of politics out. Let's take uh, pink ribbons and pink shoes for breast cancer, because these are all political decisions by the NFL. So if we're going to take it out, let's take it all out. But if not, let's not pick and choose and cherry pick what we like and what we dislike. Because really, in terms of sports, the politics we don't like on the field are the politics that we don't accept. So when you talk about cherry pick, what we like and what we don't like, share with us some of the type of expressions that you think athletes should have a right to demonstrate on the field. Right. Well, political aspirations and political comments aside, I think that freedom of expression that I talked about at the beginning is very, very key. And I say political freedom of expression because for African Americans, sometimes it's not just the freedom of speech because we speak with our bodies, with our hair, with, with everything that we have, because quite often we weren't able to say things verbally in our culture uh, through Jim Crow and through slavery times. So we use everything to express ourselves, especially if you go to an African American church, it's very different from the, the traditional a white church because the minister is expressing, the choirs are expressing, and it's a place that we found joy and expression. I think now, given our Sundays on football fields and in basketball courts, a lot of what we express are those emotions from being a human being. And I think it's, it's okay. I think the point of contention comes in here. It's that traditionally sports have been all white, mainstream sports in America. And if you have whites, Deciding those rules for other whites who are playing the sport, I can accept that. That actually makes a lot of sense. But we're talking about a league like football in the early 50s was still 100% white. And that, that's okay. So now that you have the league at 68% African American, when do other cultures get to factor into the making of rules about sport? Now, I pro, I've been talking about this since 1989 when I first started my research. And I'm happy to say that this year, for the first time, the NFL said, Dr. Andrews, I think you might be right about this. So we're going to allow people to express themselves. This is the first year. Now, I don't want to be cynical, but I will say that I think part of the reasoning was is they were losing a lot of their African-American base because of protests against athletes protesting. And so while I do think it was a bit Machiavellian, I've decided that I'm still okay with it. The change happened anyway. And as it, my contention though, is that you have to take the rules off the books. You can't ease it in when you like, and then when a huge majority of whites start complaining, then pull it back. Now what's the freedom of expression and you should allow it. And athletes will, will, will monitor themselves too. And most athletes say it's okay to have a little fun in the field. So one of the ways that we see athlete expression is really manifested in end zone celebrations, celebrations, you know, after a play. And you have written extensively about end zone celebrations. And there are many people who think that has no role in sport and they see it as defiant. Um, talk about the whole notion of end zone celebrations and why you think they're important in sport. Right. Well, they're outlawed completely in college football. Completely. You can't spike the football. You can't point to the crowd. You can't do anything that would draw attention to yourself. You have to celebrate with your teammates, basically. So it's out in college football. Uh, the professional game has ebbed and flowed depending on the year. Now, the first rules came in in 1984, and ever since then, they've been going back and forth. Now, this year, they've allowed full expression in sport. Now, I should say personally, um, I don't like most end zone expression. Uh, and not because it's, uh, I think it's out of line in football, it's just that I don't think they practiced enough. I don't think they really thought about it. I don't think they're individual enough. They kind of fall in line. This year has been very different. I've been surprised by a lot of fun the players are having. So the owners want players to hate each other, and they want there to be war, and they want it to be a nasty sport. But now the players are all in the same union. So now players can have fun and feel like, and feel like they're still friends off the field and shake hands and do prayers and whatever else. So... I think it's important for athletes to be able to express full emotions. And I say this because when athletes have been shut down, told don't express themselves, something inside them dies. And they've talked about that, that it's not fun anymore. And so for fan, for home fans, they always enjoy expression. 
It's the road fans that tend not to enjoy it. And I wrote about that, that if you tend to express yourself at home, it's more acceptable than when you're on the road in front of the opposing crowd. So <clears throat> when you talk about the freedom of expression um, and you talk about the rules, there's a perception that this whole notion of sportsmanship um, have been instituted as a way of controlling the, ex the bodily expressions of many athletes. And in many regards, we see many of those athletes who are doing the, the celebrations, doing the end zones, and all the, those other types of expressions, many of them are African-American. But I want you to talk about this concept of sportsmanship and how that infringes on this notion of freedom of expression for athletes. Right, and sportsmanship is one of those contentious phrases that, that, that's come along. And the idea is, and, and I found that in my research, in my own personal research, when I asked people what good sportsmanship was, Everybody, black and white, came up with the exact same answers. The differences came up, uh, Ketra, were the question, were, what is bad sportsmanship? And many people varied, and African-Americans and, African and whites really varied on what bad sportsmanship was. Because for some, dancing or slam dunking or a behind-the-back pass was bad expression. But for a lot of black athletes, violence was bad sportsmanship. Throwing a pitch at a batter's head, uh, trying to intentionally spike someone, or uh, trying to intentionally harm someone on the football field, or seeing someone express themselves and inflicting harm. Those things at black athletes thought were bad sportsmanship. And traditionally in this country, given that we're founded on violence, violence is accepted as a condoned way of behaving. And not often is considered bad. It's, it's, it's considered appropriate uh, redress of grievances, shall we say. So, so in my ex experience, black athletes thought violence was, a, it was bad expression, and white athletes thought that any expressions of joy were bad, ex bad sportsmanship. Wow. <clears throat> so it's interesting to see uh, the cultural contours of what constitutes sportsmanship and what constitutes appropriate expression and inappropriate expression. One of the things you alluded to earlier, when we look at sport in the black community, I mean, you're a sports sociology scholar, so you're deep into the weeds of the intersection of sport, race, culture, gender, uh, et cetera. I want you to talk a little bit about the cultural, social, symbolic significance of sport for black males, because many of the black males are the ones who are out front with the activism and the expression. What is so symbolic about sport that they're really using that platform of, as a way of establishing masculinity or otherwise? Oh, my goodness. That's a, that's a big one. <laughs> Let's see. Well, very good question. Because if we don't see why an athlete's doing it, we have to ask why. And, boy, it's a much it, – I'm, I'm going to go do a deeper dive and ask the, 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 the bigger question, which is uh, – or, or make a statement about American society. Look, African-Americans have traditionally not had many paths for success, not as many as whites, and not out of our own doing, but because there are a lot of roadblocks to the areas we're allowed to compete in. Even sport, up until the 50s, predominantly was, was said to be white because we, weren't, we couldn't contribute on the same level or compete on the same level as whites. And this is with, with male and female athletes, too, black male and female. So I have a chapter in my book called Act Like You've Been There Before. And it's based on the concept that whites are saying, you know, why don't you pretend that you've had wealth all along? Pretend that you have, can have a job anywhere. Why don't you just pretend all these things and not be happy when something good happens to you? And I had to really break down that, that phrase because that phrase is intended, that, that phrase is a taunt. It's telling us to pretend that we have something that you held back from us. And so for African-Americans, when we do succeed somewhere, like in sport, one of those few avenues, to a degree, uh, I would say Hollywood and maybe to a degree politics nowadays, academia, we have been allowed avenues for success and there have been streams of people coming through. But my goodness, to tell me to just shut up and sit down because you've always had those privileges and I should act like you, I should pretend, uh, th that is, for me, that's just disgraceful. And I don't think actually many whites realize when they make that phrase. So sport has been so significant for African-Americans because it is one of those avenues where we get as close as we possibly see to meritocracy and the myth of meritocracy. And so if we achieve in this arena, 
uh, for African American males who, for the most part, have had struggles with masculinity, with manhood, with achieving, with protecting the family, with providing for the family, due to what's being ripped apart way back in slavery times from the family. So, so, so given that, this is, I think this is the black male chance to be a warrior. That's where he can become a warrior. That's where he can say, you know what, I've got strength, I've got power, I've got skill, I've got deception, I've got all those things, I'm gonna bring those things together and practice and do well at that, and I'm gonna achieve. Now, as youth, as black youth, and especially black males, that's a sign of masculinity. And regrettably, that's the only path, but now we're seeing other paths open up, so I don't want us to focus just on that, because I think that, that even in recreation, black men can still get that joy. But I see this as a, a contestation for a black men battling with masculinity, but now slowly creeping out and saying, you know what, maybe it's not just about masculinity, maybe it's about power. And if we have the power, what do we do with this power? And I think the shift has happened that they say we can use this power for social good rather than for our own self-aggrandizement. So when you talk about power and you know the contestation that's going on, we have you know, owners and managers and even coaches to some extent trying to make sure that they are curtailing the expressions. And yet you talk about the, the cultural significance of sport to black athletes. And so athletes are also trying to push the boundaries of expression. There's a concept that I know you uh, have written about and you know about the cool poles phenomena that like provides an element of resistance through expression. Explain to the audience what that concept is and how it applies to free expression, the cool poles phenomena. So that's about African-American males in primarily African-American communities, walking in a certain way, standing in a certain way, using their bodies as a sort of a personal shield, not only against you know, aggression, but also to show that they're in control, that they have power, that they, they are, are men, that they can be attractive, all those other embedded things. This was, because all we had control over was our own bodies. Quite often we didn't own a home or we didn't have a great job. So at least if we could look the part, it may be a bit deceptive, but um, if we could at least look the part and feel like we were shielding ourselves from harm, then it gave us a sense of strength. And, and so that gets carried into every arena that we're in. And sometimes I have to tell my students, okay, you know what? You're in class now. This is, this is a, you don't have to do all that now. Let's just focus on, you know, turn your hat around, or pull your pants up, sit there, you know, because sometimes we take it from, from one arena to the next and are not conscious of still doing that. That we can actually, I mean, and it's that, that double consciousness we have to have. We have to kind of be in control. And we also have to learn that we have to let people in to allow us that, that feminine side or whatever is that, that we've been resisting. So I think the cool folks can have some harm for black men also because we can get so hardened and so used to defending ourselves on our own personal turf that we don't let in that feminine side or they don't become kind and gentle. And I think that's slowly happening as teachers like you and I start teaching mindfulness and that, they're, that you don't have to worry about protecting yourself anymore. Now's the time to actually give back and grow. Tell me your perception of where this movement is as we get ready to wind down this conversation. How do you feel about what we're seeing, the impact it's having, either on the athletes, on the fans, on the institution of sport? How would you evaluate this movement that we're seeing relative to free speech in sport? Well, I think there have been some successes. And I don't think it's, I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to say we've taken two steps forward and one step back, but I just think we've taken two steps forward. I think that we've fought for this freedom of expression. Uh, I think we have it now. Baseball is still far behind because baseball is 8% African-American now. So they're not as concerned as the NBA and the NFL are with allowing athletes to speak up and, and move forward. I think the main reason the NFL and the NBA have come to the party is because they see that the purpose of the movement was valid. If athletes ask the question, are you okay with black people being slaughtered without any police protection at times, without any police bringing about with charges. Most people say, well, no, people should be accountable. And those, excuse me, those things shouldn't have happened. And that came out wrong and we're sorry. And, you know, just like with school shootings, thoughts and prayers only go so far. 
we're about we need to be about preventing this from happening in the future and doing everything we can so so in that sense i think there's there's been progress and i think there's more progress to be made because i think more people realize you know there will always be detractors that say oh this is anti-america or it's anti-cops or it's anti the military or it's anti first responders but i think those people are in some deep denial about what's going on and i can understand if you live in a community that has all you know, police officers and they protect you and they take your cats out of trees and they're always there for you you could get a feeling of the false consensus hypothesis which is well, the way I see police officers and the way they see me is, is the way everyone should, because this is how they treat me, and I'm sure they treat everyone else this way. So why are you upset? Because they treat you like this. Well, I think people, we just live in bubbles in, in very, very different worlds. And I, my hope is that the more and more Black Lives Matter speaks out, the more and more white allies get on board, and other cultures come to the party, they say, wow, we can actually see this, even though it has nothing to do with us, it's important. That's why I say to my students, the reason why I promote uh, Native Americans in their fight for the elimination of names, uh, racist names in football and sports, is because even though that issue isn't my issue, I'm still part of the problem unless I'm moving in the direction of solving it. And that's a valid case they make, and I, and I try to fight for that, or women's issues as much as I can these days, because I think women should be in more leadership positions. They should be running the country. We should give them their due chance to, to run the show. So I promote my female students really pushing themselves to be in leadership roles and take those leadership roles as they often do in student groups. And I think with, with this movement, and I can understand white males feeling like their turf is being taken over, but it never was their turf. They were only holding people out illegally. And now it's time to really tr truly be a meritocratic society where we can all participate and help solving these problems because they have not solved the problems on their own. Well, again, you have been um, providing us with so much insightful information. I want to give you a chance to make any call to action or any closing remarks relative this, to this debate and this notion of free speech in sport. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see that women in the WNBA are expressing themselves, high school athletes now are expressing themselves, and primarily in line with the cause of you know, social justice. And each movement that I see is about social justice, whether it's women protesting for equal pay, whether it's, again, Native Americans protesting for those names being taken away. And Major League Baseball agreed uh, about a month ago that, yes, that Cleveland should get away with Chief Wahoo as its mascot. So we're hoping for the same thing with, with Washington and its football team, its professional football team. But I think my... my call to action with my students that I usually say is, I want people to look at why people protest and, and key into it and listen to their own words about why they're doing what they do. Because quite often, if you go to some website or hear your own social bubble about what they say, then it gets all distorted. One man at a grocery store said to me, he said, um, you know, he says, do you support the Black Lives Matter movement? And I said, yes. And he says, well, for me, and that's like saying, that's me saying to you that I'm a member of the KKK. And I said, how did you get that notion? How did we get, you know, to lynching people and whatnot? Um, and I realized that the news that he watches and listens to continually say negative things about the other, whether it's women or blacks or Mexican Americans or immigrants or anything else. And I think we have to be careful of the information we consume. I would like everybody to look at issues and get involved in issues apart from their own cultural, racial, ethnic, sexual group also, because that brings us together. And so if for blacks to be involved in the Native American movement, to be involved with women's issues, to be involved with gay and lesbian, LGBT issues, all these things cross pollinate us and give us a bigger vision of what the society could be. So my call to action for students is just step out of your own world, look at someone else's protest, understand they're like students protesting now in florida and now around the country i mean my goodness tomorrow we're going to have a big wave in this country on march 24th and i'm in full support of my students going and participating at the collegiate level so i say step outside yourself look at what others are doing join in to a counter protest and just like we like white allies who come involved in african-american movements 
we need to be black allies with those movements because listen, I've lived in New Zealand for 14 years. You would not believe how they look at us as role models, as African Americans. Strong role models for them to get back all of their rights. People around the world look to African American culture for signs of protest. So at some point we acknowledge that and say, yeah, let's keep doing what we're doing and let's spread the wealth. So my call to action is just for people to look outside themselves, look at other movements, study those movements, and talk to those people and listen to their words on why they do what they do. Well, thank you so much for giving us this interesting understanding of the juxtaposition of race and culture and masculinity and sport and politics and culture. I mean, that's what makes this whole discipline of sports sociology so fascinating. Um, thank you so much. Again, Dr. Vernon Andrews, a sports sociologist and a lecturer at San Jose State University, giving us some very unique insight on why expression is so important to sport in general and, and maybe notably for African-American males in particular. Thank you so much, Dr. Andrews. Well, thank you for your time, and I thank your students for listening in. You as well.